Right, now we're going to look at the effects of flowing water on erosion and actually the transport processes, uh, some of the transport processes that impact sediment movement in overland flow. So let's recap. Water flowing over a hill slope. Right, we can describe some of those equations and Rose does that in his book. But uh, essentially we often describe it as a kinematic type wave. But let's just imagine here we have at x equals zero, we have the top of the hill. So we have no, uh, no overland flow being generated. Right? As the rainfall intensity is high in this case, infiltration rate is low, then we generally get a build up of the depth of overland flow as we move down the hill. And as the flow deepens, then the water flux can increase. Right? Alpha's the slope angle there. So as the flow increases, then we increase the potential that that water has the enough energy to start moving soil particles down the slope. Right? So there's a, a couple of things here. The potential for overland flow to mobilize sediments is going to depend upon the, on the velocity of that overland flow. And things that impact that surface water flux are things like the soil properties, of course, but in terms of the hill slope properties, we're looking at things like the slope of the hill uh, and the slope length. The longer the slope, of course, then you have the greater potential for the discharge to increase as we, as we move away from the hill. So you may have been introduced to this before, but Manning was uh, an engineer who came up with a bunch of equations describing uh, the velocity of, water uh, velocity of water movement in channels. He was interested in designing channels that didn't erode and um, so you could put bridges over them and that sort of thing. But the, this sort of relationship holds for a whole bunch of different scales of water flow over, over land. So he came up with an equation which really describes the velocity of overland flow is dependent upon the slope s raised to some power, usually that power is a half, uh, divided by some roughness coefficient n, and this coefficient n depends upon a whole bunch of things, what type of vegetation you have, uh, whether you have rocks, and usually this is sort of an empirical parameter. And the other parameter that he used was d, the depth of discharge like we described previously, right? And that is usually raised to a power of two thirds, but um, sometimes this exponent changes depending upon whether it's turbulent or laminar flow. So people have tested this equation over and over again and it sort of works reasonably well, right? So you can use it, for example, people have been using Manning's equation to estimate the flow rate in rills and gullies. And these guys here, I, I to, I've got to be um, honest, I've lost the reference to this paper. Um, but this paper, they describe um, overland flow experiments over the top of vegetation. And these guys were particularly interested in looking at how the vegetation cover, uh, as it changed with height above the soil surface, impacted the roughness coefficient n, Manning's n, right? So they did a bunch of experiments and um, for their experiments, they found this A parameter equals two, B equals one, when they had laminar flow, and when it was turbulent, so the flow's mixing, um, then this A parameter decreased and the B parameter decreased as well. So what they did, they had different crops that they chucked a bunch of water over the top of, the various depths. Here we have the depth of that overland flow above the surface, and this is also the, the height, really, of the canopy. And this curve here describes the vegetation density as a function of height above the soil surface. So the solid line here describes that vegetation density uh, above the soil surface, um, which sort of, in this case, it decreased uh, as you got further and further uh, away from the soil. And in this case, the bottom case here, their density actually increased the solid line here slightly uh, as the canopy height increased. Okay. So what they did, they applied some water to the soil surface and then estimated um, from Manning's equation the roughness coefficient by effectively measuring um, these parameters, the uh, hydraulic uh, radius R, which is really just the 
the cross-sectional area of the flow divided by the, the perimeter. So it's like the, um, if you were to look down the hill slope, um, the wetted perimeter would be the width of that overland flow and the height of the overland flow on both sides. But because the height is usually really, really small, effectively it's just the, the width of that overland flow if you were to do some sort of experiment. And the cross-sectional area is really the um, the height of your channel, right, or the height of your water flow. So, or the depth of your water flow times the width, right? And the width wetted perimeter of the channel. So, if your wetted perimeter of the channel changes, then this would affect R. And the slope S is just the slope of your hill, right? So, what they did, they applied water flows to different depths and measured or estimated Manning's N, right, the roughness coefficient. So in the bottom case here, as the flow depth increased, then the roughness, Manning's N, the roughness coefficient increased, which says that the surface is getting rougher. And if N's increasing, then it's going to slow down the rate of increase in this water flow velocity right? as, the, um, as the water flow depth increases. But in this case here, this in the top case, Manning's N only increased up until a certain point, and then as the flow depth increased, because the canopy is decreasing, uh, the can canopy density is decreasing, then Manning's N decreased again. Right? So the, the velocity was able to increase again above a certain point. So it's a really interesting interaction between vegetation and the hydraulics of water flow over this hill slope. Now a diagram that you should be well aware of uh, and that really has important uh, implications for you trying to estimate uh, whether your soil or what particles are going to be susceptible to movement is a diagram that was really developed by Hallstrom in, I think he was in Copenhagen or somewhere like that, somewhere in, somewhere in the, the Nordic countries. And he developed, what he did, he was walking to and from work every day and he was just looking at his little stream that was going past uh, you know, the road on his way to work and he noticed that some days the, the sediments, you know, the, the, the water flowing in this channel was, was full of sediment uh, and in other days it wasn't and he thought, well, maybe that's related to the water flow velocity. So he did some basic measurements on his way to work every day. And he measured the water flow velocity and he measured the maximum particle size that was being mobilised uh, in the in the water column, okay. So it's the the maximum particle size that was being moved with the flow, and he came up with a really neat diagram. Actually, he found that when your water flow flow velocity was high above this large uh, dash line, uh, this dash line at the top here, when the water flow velocity was high, you got erosion, right? And above say 0.1 to one millimeter in particle size then there was an increase in the water flow velocity uh, corresponding, uh, so the particle size that was mo moved by water flow um, only increased if the water flow velocity increased. Okay? Interestingly, below 0.1, we had to get an increase in water flow velocity again to mobilize uh, those particles. And, Part of the reason for that is because here we have interparticle bonding, right? clay molecules which are liking to stick to each other. We have uh, a cohesive sediments uh, which are wanting to stick to each other rather than moved into the flow. And so below a certain uh, particle size, the water flow velocity again had to increase to move those particles right? as into the, into the water column and erode them in the channel. When the water flow velocity fell below a certain level, then those particles started to deposit right, onto the stream bed and they were no longer in the water column. So we have this threshold line here, this solid line here, describes a threshold velocity below which then we got deposition of those particles onto the stream bed. Right. And then there's this other region in here, above the fall velocity, uh, but below where we had complete erosion and mobilization of the water column where we had transport. And what we have here is we have 
water flow velocities that are capable of of moving the particles as bed flow or as or as um, bed load uh, along the bottom of the stream, but not necessarily in the full uh, water column. So within this region, we have bed load. Above this region, we have full mobilization in the water column. And then below this region, in this region here, we have deposition. And I'll provide a link to a guy who gives a really nice talk on the Hallstrom diagram. So water flow velocities are not uniform in a stream though, right? So they, because we have friction at the bottom, um, we, we have a, what's called a zero flow um, at the interface of a solid and, a, and the liquid. Uh, so the water flow velocity at that interface must be zero as well. So what happens is we have an increase in our water flow velocity, these da da dash lines here, as we move away from the source, uh, from the from the surface, and this increase is logarithmic, right? and there's well explained fluid mechanics reasons for why that is, um, and the rate of increase depends upon the density of the fluid, right? So for water columns, we get a quite a, a rapid increase uh, up to the surface because the water is denser. But for air, because it's much less dense, then it takes a lot longer to reach the same, um, the same equilibrium, right? Where we have fully, in, you know, fully entrained flow and the, the maximum velocity is achieved. And that's what I mean by maximum, right? So, for example, in real flow, we need water flow velocities of about 0.6 meters per second will be about a maximum for real flow. And that's flow that's about 65 millimeters deep. Um, but for wind to actually move the same amount of sediment, uh, you know, we need wind velocity is about six meters per second. And it takes a full two meters uh, for that mean velocity profile to be reached or sort of the maximum velocity profile to be reached. And the water flow velocities are not constant during a rainfall event, right? So here are a bunch of simulations of runoff from a hill slope. Here we have the rainfall intensity varying throughout an event. Uh, again, three different rainfall events with the same total amount of rainfall, but the rainfall just falling in different ways. So in this case, top right hand corner, we have rain, most of the rain falling at the beginning of the event. In the bottom left hand corner, we have a large rainfall intensity throughout the middle and towards the end of the event. And this bottom right hand corner, we have most of the rain falling towards the middle of the event. And the solid line here is the runoff rate, right, in cubic meters per second down this channel. And so you can see that the hydrographs, the, or effectively the water flow velocities, are going to depend a lot on how the rain fell. Right? Particularly on smaller hill slopes, which are going to be, um, have very little memory um, of historical rainfall, they're going to respond flashy, you know, in a flashy sort of manner to how the rain actually falls. And then once the water's flowing over the surface, then we can have a bunch of different processes going on. Now this diagram's a little bit complicated, so bear with me. But it's really important to understand how um, we can describe total sediment transport. Um, and there's a bunch of different terms I want you to remember. So there's, there's detachment, right? So that's movement of a soil particle from the surface up into the flow. Then we have transport, right? It's movement of the particle. And we have transport capacity, right? So the transport capacity is the ability of that water to transmit sediments. It's like the total amount of sediment that can be moved by a flow, right? It's the maximum amount of sediment that can be moved by a flow. Can you imagine if you chock up all, the, all your water with sediment, then a lot of the energy in the water flow is gonna be taken up by moving the sediment, by resisting gravity, and by moving it forward and so eventually you reach a point where all that energy is used up and then you can't move any more sediment. Right? There's a sediment load so this is the total amount of sediment that's being moved right? 
uh, in, in the flow. And then we have deposition, and deposition is the movement of sediments from the column, water column, back down onto the soil surface. So we can have situations where we have detachment limited transport and transport limited uh, um, transport of sediments, right? Or we'll reach our transport capacity. So let's go to the top of our hill, right? We've got low flow at the top of our hill and the flow is below that threshold on our Hallstrom diagram. And so we can't mobilize sediments, right? Any sediments that were possibly in the flow by rain splash are just, de just depositing out and, and not being mobilized in the overland flow. So we have a non-erodible region near the tops of hill slopes where the flow velocities are low, where we can't move those sediments that are typical for that soil up into the flow. Then all of a sudden we reach a certain flow rate and then we reach what's called, we have, we establish a transport capacity, right? This dash line here, which goes all the way through, drops off here because it drops down here because we're suggesting that all of a sudden the flow rate is decreasing at this point to a new flow rate down here. So we have what's called a transport capacity and all of a sudden we reach that a point here where we can, the flow velocity is increased enough that we can start to move sediments. And then what happens is we have a high detachment rate. And the detachment rate is maximum here because we have no sediments in the, in the water column. And so it's, the water has a lot of energy to be able to move those sediments up into the surface. It's not it's not utilizing all that energy to keep the sediments moving. So we have a maximum detachment rate, and then that decreases as we continue down uh, the hill because we're mobilizing more and more sediments up into, up into the water column. And we can see that here by the curve which describes the sediment load. So as the sediment load increases up towards the transport capacity, then our detachment rate, this is the movement of sediment up into the water column decreases over time and then eventually we reach a point where the water column can't hold any more sediment right it's carrying the maximum load of sediment um, at that flow and we have a period here a, a zone here where we have equal amounts of detachment and um, deposition okay so what we might have, for example, is we have some soil landing back uh, on the surface, but because we have soil moving away from the water column, then there's a little bit of energy left to keep this, um, move more sediment back up into the water column. So we have sort of an equilibrium going on where we have um, equal or no net movement of sediments um, uh, from the surface, right? Some is landing, but some is being injected back up into the flow. Now, if we turned off the flow or reduced the flow a little bit and then down to a new level, um, maybe the rainfall, rainfall intensity decrease suddenly um, and we get a new flow velocity, because the sediments that were in the transport can't be carried by that flow, then we get a, a deposition event. We get deposition of those sediments. Right? So the detachment rate becomes negative. We get a deposition rate. And that deposition rate gradually increases until we reach a new equilibrium. So the flow is again back towards its transport capacity. Right? Now, if we were to go to an experiment and we were to mix up a whole heap of particle sizes, inject those particle sizes into a flow, and then downstream of where we did all the mixing, here's distance downstream from where we did all that mixing, we look at the flow and look at which particle sizes are still in that flow, then what we'd find is that the fine particles like clays and all that sort of stuff would still be in the flow say 100 metres away from where we started. But we'd have only a small fraction of 
uh, we'd have a, a less fraction of, of moderate sized particles and then almost no partic or almost no coarse particles by the time we get to that 100 meters. And so the select pardon me the selective de deposition right we're going to lose our coarse, coarse particles first and we're going to have our fine particles moved greater distances. Right? And this selective uh, transport of particles by size has important implications for things like sedimentology and uh, reconstructing flood events and uh, a whole bunch of other things, right? But it's also going to impact which particles are going to be moved the furthest and which particles you're going to be left behind with after a flow event. And you can sort of see this in some um, experiments that people have conducted. And here's a photo which shows sort of the same sort of thing. So here we have a little rill, right, on a, on a bare patch of soil. And what you can see here is at the edges of the rill, we have deposition of coarse sediments. Right? These dry areas here uh, are dry because they're not holding onto the water as much because they're coarse soils. Whereas on the, in the rill and on the edges of the rill, we, what we were left with behind is a much of finer uh, particles that were deposited only when the flow got low enough. Right? When the flow was relatively high, we had deposition of these coarse particles first on the rills, and then as the flow decreased in towards the rill area, towards the end of the event, then we have finer particles in the rill. Like I said before, we have these distribution of flow velocities, right? And this happens not only vertically, which was what I described before, right? Uh, friction on the bottom, which means that we have zero velocity uh, right at the bottom, but which gradually increases and then it might decrease again towards the top uh, because we have some friction due to air. But also if you're looking down on top of a stream you also have flow velocities that are highest near the center of the channel and least near the edges. And this, these, these flow velocities again are going to impact where erosion happens, right? And if you look at another cross section here, we have a V, you know, a trapezoidal type channel. We are going to have the highest velocities in the center of the channel here, and then gradually decreasing velocities as we move away right, um, from that flow. So this, you can see how this might impact uh, gully uh, development, right? Or, or the transformation of, a, of sheet flow into real flow and then into a gully over time. So let's say we started off with a rill that was sort of shaped like this and we had water flow, right? Now the deeper the water flow, of course, the higher the flow velocities and on the edges, the flow velocities are going to be the least, right? Because we have some friction going on and we're going to have the highest velocities in the center here. And those high velocities then are going to potentially um, impact the erosion at the bottom of these channels a little bit more because right, you can have turbulence and other things going on. And what that's going to lead to is a situation where we have slight increases in erosion at the sides here, but more prevalent erosion cutting down into the stream or into the rill. And that's going to deepen these rills much more quickly than it will the inter-rills. And so what you get is gradual progression of this little rill vertically downwards and as that gets deeper and if these sides are quite steep then you get slumping in from the sides right like we do in gullies and of course if we go up to another scale then we move away from rills but we actually look at hill slopes let's look at here's the topography um, this is high elevation and we move down the hill, right? And we have slightly lower elevations. These are elevation contours. And what those elevation contours suggest is water flow will like to move perpendicular to those elevation contours. So if, for example, we have water flow converging into a point like we have in this case, then we're going to have high water flow velocities at this point, right? And further down uh, this little... Um, uh, ephemeral gully for example and here we have a diverging zone right this is the maybe the toe of a hill slope somewhere but we have a diverging zone where the water flow lines are moving away from each other so we're not going to have 
an increase in the well, a significant increase in the depth of overland flow here because the water's spreading out laterally. But when we have this concentration of overland flow, then we're going to have high velocities at these points, and this is going to lead to the propagation or the development of a gully head or a, um, a rill head that turns into a gully head, and that will gradually move up the hill. Okay. So, in summary, erosion occurs as a three-stage process. First, we need to get the particles detached from the soil surface and into the flow. Then we transport those particles, and eventually, when the flow decreases uh, due to the cessation of the rainfall event, or we've moved into a flatter area and the flow velocities have decreased, then we'll get deposition of those sediments somewhere else. Uh, we have a whole different types of erosion types, and I've mentioned some of those, splash, interrill, rill and gully erosion. Now, interrills, I've only briefly mentioned before, but they're just the, the little mounds in between the rills. All right. And we have a whole heap of factors which regulate erosion. The topography, of course, where flow is going to be concentrated to, the slope of the hill, the slope length, whether flow is accumulating or whether a flow is dispersing from an area. And we have soil and soil surface properties, which I'm going to come to later on. And of course, a big factor is climate variability, rainfall variability, and how the rain fell.